Okay. So okay. it looks like all, all three items were approved with one abstention. So thank you very much for your votes. All right, now the end of our agenda, we're just about finished. A um, Couple of announcements. Um, the state convention is coming up June 4th and 5th. It will be by Zoom. And we will be uh, allotted a certain number of delegates depending on our, the size of our membership. And I haven't heard that yet from the state office. But when we um, get our quota of how many delegates we can have, um, we will um, um, put out a, a notice that if you'd like to be a delegate, and, and you know, board members, of course, will probably get priority, but hopefully we'll have enough delegates that we can open it up to members who are interested and we will let you know more about that. And then um, I forgot to do two important things, and that was to ask Wendy and um, our new, <clears throat> our newest board members, um, Wendy and um, Paula. I mean, I haven't met Paula yet. I've known Wendy for a long time, but um, just in a you know a minute or two. So if you, Wendy, why don't you start? If you would unmute and wave at everybody so they know who you are and uh, just introduce yourself real quick. We're glad you're coming on the board, Wendy. Sure. Uh, yeah, okay, well, thank you, Sally. And it's nice to see a lot of um, familiar names and faces. Um, I'll just give a quick bullet point of some of my um, experience, I think that might be relevant to the league. Um, I was on the uh, member of Zanta Club of Tallahassee for about 10 years, um, including serving on the board for a number of years and as, and as president. Um, and really enjoyed the service and advocacy, so the advocacy uh, component of that. And for the last three years, I've been involved with a group called the Alliance of Tallahassee Neighborhoods that has been very involved in trying to advocate for uh, neighborhood involvement in important local government decisions. Um, in my professional background, I'm currently retired, but I have a master's degree in regional planning from Cornell University. And among my professional experience, I served as planning director for Tallahassee and Leon County from 1992 to 2002. and had my own private consulting firm uh, from that point till 2019 when I retired. And I look forward to serving uh, with this board. Thank you, Sally. Well, welcome, Wendy. I, I'm really glad you're with us now. And now Paula, Paula DeBowles Johnson, would you unmute and, and wave at us? And so tell us a little Hi, bit. Hi everybody, let me stop my video. How are you this evening? Great, I hope. A lot of great information that you've shared. Um, thank you for allowing me to serve. I do a couple of things. I have a small nonprofit in the city, the Capital City Youth Development Corporation. Um, we're going on about 17 years old. I also work for Leon County Government. I'm their employee engagement and performance manager. I'm responsible for the training and professional development for our 800 plus team members. Um, I've been fairly active in the community since I arrived in the 80s. Um, I've chaired the um, Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. I have um, been a part of the Tallahassee Human Relations Council uh league of women voters for three years i thought i heard something in the introduction about me and virginia and league of women voters i've only been here in florida i'm not sure where that came from but um what there's been a number of other things that i've done in the committee uh in the community but i am committed to women girls um equal access especially in terms of voting fair elections, those kind of things. Um, so I'm happy to be a part and I wanna jump in and work where I can. Well, we welcome you, Paula. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to serve on our board. So uh, the last thing I just wanted to announce that uh, the board decided we're gonna take a break in June and July. We're not gonna, um, we're going to, um, sign off, no newsletters, kind of go dark. Of course, you can always still reach us, but we're not gonna have any formal activities. We're, we're tired, <laughs> we're ready for a break. And so June and July is our vacation month and then we'll resume in August with a planning retreat and then hit the ground running in, in September with our uh, weekly meetings, our board meetings and our hot topics. So um, with that said, I thank you for being here for our meeting and I'm going to adjourn the business meeting now. And um, 
thank you again for being here. Give us some input on um, how things are going from your perspective, because we want to hear from your, our members. So now let me turn it over to our program for tonight. And I'm really so excited to have our speaker, Valerie Schoon, who's one of our members. And also Valerie, as it turns out, is one of my neighbors. And I first was, saw this uh, magazine called Midtown Neighbors. And look at here, there's Valerie and her husband and her son on the cover of the magazine. So they're active in our neighborhood. And let me just tell you real quickly about Valerie because she's gonna really talk about her career and show you a clip from her latest uh, documentary. But Valerie is a professor at the FSU College of Motion Picture Arts. And um, she oversees script development of graduate and undergraduate thesis films. And she teaches a documentary filmmaking class. And during her tenure, her students have won 10 student Emmys. And um, she also has her own film company called True Visions. And she has served as an executive at Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Films with credits including the Golden Globe nominated The Great Debaters starring Denzel Washington, as well as an adapt adaptation of Beloved by the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, Toni Morrison. So that's, there's a lot more to tell you about her, but I'm going to let her tell you her story, which is very interesting, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to it. I should also mention that her sister, Cecile Schoon, is about to become our state league president. So how about that? So we have um, uh, double uh, stuff to be looking forward to. So Valerie Schoon, I turn it over to you. Um, and we welcome you. Uh, we want to learn more about your exciting career. So hi, it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk. And um, yes, I think my sister, Cecile, I think I, I admitted her, so I think she's still here. Um, so maybe she'll say something uh, a little bit later. Um, yes, I'm a member of the league um, and I certainly have been, before I even joined, I've heard a lot about it from Cecile and, um, so I'm glad to be sharing this. So a little bit to you. So you did give a view into my past, my history, you know, by working as a filmmaker. So I'll I'll just sort of give you a Reader's Digest um, interpretation of it, and then I'll show you a clip from my most recent doc, and then leave a little bit of space for questions. Um, but as um, Sarah mentioned, I my career really started in Hollywood. Um, and I worked on, I did, I work in the movie, the half of the movie business that's called the creative half. Um, so there's the creative half and then there's the production half. Now they're both creative, but those are just terms of art. So creative basically means everything that happens up until the point that you have a green light for a film. So there's a lot more thing, a lot more ideas for movies, a lot more screenplays for movies than you'll ever actually make because they cost, they cost money and time. <laughs> um, um, although there's now a lot more with digital, things are cheaper, but um, all right. So, so for my, my work is really to think about what would make a good movie. So my, I get, when I was a studio executive at Warner Brothers, my job was to um, listen to verbal pitches, people coming into the office, um, describing what they think would make a good film and then me assessing whether I thought, whether I agreed, thought the studio should buy it. So in case you're wondering how studios work, um, there's about eight people who actually make those decisions about what the studio buys. <laughs> um, and then there's all the other people who actually sort of make it happen once once we, once a project is greenlit. Um, I should sort of, and we also would buy screenplays, of course. Uh, although I'd say that we buy things, but we don't make those things. We buy things and then we think, how can we make that thing better, right? So how can I make that screenplay better? Um, and that's where you get something called story notes, um, which is what I would write, <laughs> which would be like a five page, you know, single space, you know, critical document basically, you know, in a nice way saying you, this needs to be improved, that needs to be improved, that needs to be improved, you know, we love everything. We used to joke that notes would be like, I love everything up to page two, <laughs> you know? Um, and so basically the writer would go off and, with these notes and rewrite the script and then come back. But it's, it's collaborative, it's not dictatorial. Um, so the movie business, part of the reason why I'm in the movie business is I like the fact that it's so collaborative. Um, if it wasn't, you know, my other job, if I was gonna pick a different career would be to be a historian. 
but I decided that was a little bit too singular um, doing your doing your singular research, but I like the idea of doing collaborative projects. Um, and working in movies allows me to sort of do both. Um, at Warner Brothers, I was able to work on um, Spike Lee's Malcolm X. So it was kind of a, a combination of all my interests, you know, history, movies, you know. Um, um, and so I really appreciated that. Um, but I also appreciated just a range of things you could work on at a studio. So it would include things like um, The Secret Garden or The Fugitive or um, something. Every time this movie comes on, my, my family tells me how bad it is. Face off. <laughs> you know, so um, so you, you work on a range of things like a doctor. You don't get to pick like what your patient's problems is. You know, they, they sort of come in with a range. And then I left there. Um, after a bit, because I, I was also interested in documentaries, and I went to work for public for PBS, PBS headquarters in DC. And again, basically, my job was to again look for material that would be good for um, PBS stations. So I watch half finished documentaries or all the way finished documentaries. And um, I used to joke that I'd become a dangerous person because I learned a, a little bit about a lot of subjects, <laughs> but. Uh, um, and then after about a couple of years of that, I thought, you know what, I miss movies. So I decided to go back to Hollywood. And this time I worked um, for Oprah Winfrey's film company. So as you guys know, her TV company, when she had their show was in Chicago. Um, but we also had a film office in LA, um, obviously to just focus on film. And I used to joke that this was like, if PBS had any money, this would be what they would be doing. You know what I mean? So um, so Oprah's goal was to make movies that other people wouldn't have the clout or necessarily the money to make. And so um, it was great because I got to work on um, the adaptation of Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zerona Hurston, which, you know, as a Floridian um, Harlem Renaissance writer. And if you guys have not read her book, you know, maybe it should be a book club for the um, um, Maybe it should be a, a book club for the uh, for the league, <laughs> you know. Um, but she's a she's a beautiful writer. I mean, every time I read her, I'm I'm, I'm more I'm more impressed. And I, I, I when I when you work on an adaptation, you were reading something like you know thirty times, you know what I mean, or more, you know. So you really have to enjoy the topic or what you're working on because there's no room for boredom. Um, in that world, and so anyway, so um, you might wonder how I got here. Um, so um, after working for about eight years at, 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 um, at Harpo, I opened up my own company called True Visions, where I could kind of hopefully blend my two interests, narrative films, so regular feature films and movies that are on TV, um, and, um, and documentaries, so I could sort of do both. And then in a sort of interesting convergence, I ended up coming to teach at Florida State Film School, kind of like a for a number of reasons. My husband is from Panama City, Florida. I met him from visiting my sister Cecile, who lives in Panama City, Florida. Um, and uh, con you know, confluence of things um, had me, uh, family, and I, I guess I don't have to explain all that to you, had me end up sort of moving, moving here. And um, happily, the film school exists. And, um, and it's a lot of people who also worked in Hollywood, but have reasons to be in Florida. So I was able to I'm, sort of- I'm going to interject there. Oh. I, 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 apparently, I've been given permission to make a few comments. I want you, we, my sister's been very generous to my community. And um, I've been on a lot of cultural boards locally and my sorority. And she speaks and brings her movies. And we've done situations where we've um, looked at Zora Neale Hurston's writing. And then we would show, she would show the scene that was created from the page and the students would talk about emotions that they felt, what they would have said. I mean, it's just so wonderful. And so I offer her as a resource to, to you all and different projects, it, you know, could be more civic minded or things like that. But it's a really good way to let the, st the students understand that, that everything that they see on the screen came from the written word. But I interjected because Valerie came to Panama City at yet another event that we concocted in town and we were having a film festival and she was one of the judges and uh, on the panel discussion was the FSU film dean, school dean at the time. He met Valerie at that event and by the end of the night she had an offer <laughs> to teach at FSU. So it's been really wonderful that we've 
been able to entice her away from, from um, Harpo Films and PBS and the Smithsonian and all the other places that she has worked. But she's she's a local treasure and and um, I'm obviously very, very proud of her, but I, I, I help her on some of her little uh, jaunts and she does documentaries. I carry her bags and I cook for her. That's pretty much what I do. I, I, I Sometimes I take pictures that turn up in the films, but uh, pretty much try to support um, a, a talent. So thank, that's my comment. Mm -hmm. All right, that's true. So this is my, my publicist. It's always helpful <laughs> to have it's always helpful to have your own publicist travel with you. Um, well, anyway, I just was looking at the at the time, so I, I we, I'll leave room for questions. But that's kind of an overview. So at film school, I basically do what I did in Hollywood with much smaller budgets, right? So I still listen to the students who pitch their story ideas to me, and I say, uh, well, you know, you need three acts, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Um, you know, we need, uh, you know, or it's not. One word that used in Hollywood a lot is like it's not fresh. You know, there's nothing. You know, nothing's going to grab me about this idea. And 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 on the one hand, there are no new ideas. They've all been done. You know, don't worry about that. It's just that your entry into the idea has to be fresh. Your way in has to be fresh, um, even if the story is not. So I've been doing that, um, and so it's been a great thing working at the film school. Um, and in recent years, has allowed me to work on my own documentaries. Um, also using working with students and alums of the film school. Um, and so that's worked out well. Last year, um, the league, I think, was something was sponsored, something with WFSU for me. Um, and the documentary I did last year was called Daring Women Doctors. And it's, it was about 19th century um, women physicians. And um, so that played last, last summer. And I think it's still available on, on Passport. Um, on WFSU. Anyway, <clears throat> the movie or the documentary that's most recently about to come out, uh, I thought about making because um, of the enslaved graveyard on Benton Road. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you guys have seen it. Anybody seen it? Aware of it? You can, yeah. Well, I I was aware of it when I moved here. Um, uh, when I first first moved here, but then I when I moved here four years ago into the same neighborhood as <clears throat> Sarah in Benton, I decided or I said to my son, oh, look, you know, we, we, we're only a block or two away from that enslaved graveyard. Clearly we're living on an old plantation. You know, we, sh we should research this. Now my son was maybe, I don't know, 11, you know? So I was like, well, it'll just be over the summer. We'll figure it out. Well, we should know. We're an African American family, we should know this. So um, I started researching it and I, came to understand that Tallahassee was the cotton belt of um, Northern Florida. And I, I really didn't know that. And I didn't know that uh, the whole of Tallahassee was nothing but plantations. I thought I thought when I saw that enslaved graveyard, it was like a singular plantation or two. You know what I mean? I didn't realize that the entire thing was. And what I've come to understand is that people who are generationally from here do understand that about Tallahassee's past. But for all of our the transplants, you know, such as myself and many, many other transplants who come because of TCC, FSU, and um, FAM, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know. I, I know from doing my informal polls how many people tell me they don't know this. So I decided that um, I should make a documentary because I about the topic because I thought, well, one people should know. You know, we should know. We don't. We don't have very many, if any markers you know that indicate that this that that slavery was such a big part of this history um and i thought well we need to address that you know the nine thousand enslaved people lived and died here and there's nothing to sort of indicate that um so it's not so much that i want to change the names all you know all the names are the names of plantations you know benton waverly chairs southwood all of those are historically um, plantations but it's not that i want to change those names but i just didn't want the other part of the history to be erased of the people who you know lived and died here um, building tallahassee so that was um my impetus to making the documentary and i started it in 2018 by applying for a grant with the um, florida arts humanities um we got that small grant and um a small grant can be um, made much larger because I work at the film school, you know, so that I have access to film equipment, I have access to 
colleagues who want to you know work with me and so it makes it possible for me to do a lot with a small budget um which allowed me to uh, make the film and when we first started i think people were interested but of course with last year a 2020 you know and sort of and a sort of an awakening um of um of, of the issues of race in our country it's become um hopefully more uh topical for people but the goal and Teresa Mossenberg who works at the Florida Channel is my co-producer and you know our goal basically was to do two things one show the history of of this area and two bring it up to the future so that people can kind of think like you know what are the threads what what are, what are the legacies from um slavery so that we can sort of see them in our in our community and, and address them so that when we're making policy decisions we we have all of that in our minds and so that was basically the goal um so um let me see i think like i'm happy to show you um a little bit of it we did a, a sort of a preview a few a few months ago um that sort of is like a um cut together to sort of different parts of the documentary so think of it as like a, a preview as opposed to an excerpt um but i'm happy to show you a little bit of that and then see if you have any questions oh i should also say you can watch the entire documentary on May 20th. It's going to be on PBS, or I'm sorry, WFSU, which I guess is PBS, WFSU um, at nine o'clock. And I'll, I'll give Sally that information so that she can she can share it with everybody in, in the email. But, all right, so I'm going to share the screen. Everybody see that? Yep, we see it. Yeah. Well, we don't hear, I don't hear any sound though. You don't? It becomes a matter of ah. I shared sound. Let's see. Let me try again. Oh. Please enjoy your eye and share. Hmm. Let me see. You guys couldn't hear the sound just now? I didn't. No. No. Did you put up your volume? On the I'll, try, I'll try putting up the volume. And if there's a cohort, a co-host, you might want to make sure that you have the sound optimized. I okay. yeah, I'll try that. Psychological lost to some of the How about now? Into the past. No, let me see if I turn the volume. We can hear a little bit. How about now? Much better. Hey, Dr. It went down again. So we think about slavery. We are thinking about an institution. Hey, there you go. It's good. As in fact, pass on paper. But in terms of its impact, it's still very much present. If we deny that, then we are denying the reality. The people dealing with us in terms of slavery. Florida was a very dynamic and diverse place. It was not this Disney World, Donald Duck society where everything was rosy. Florida had a history similar to Alabama and Georgia. had 45% of enslaved people in Florida. That 45% produced 90% of all the cotton in Florida by 1860. Cotton, which made the most money, 
would not have been the product of Troy had it not been for the labor of enslaved persons. So they were invincible when it came to increasing Florida's economy. And Florida's economy would not have grown so quickly had it not been for enslaved persons. Tallahassee really originates in the period of enslavement after Florida becomes a part of the United States. I mean, before that time, there really wasn't a Tallahassee. Tallahassee didn't start to 1821. The thinking, at least among many of the early arrivals, was that Tallahassee would be the new Richmond. It didn't quite work out that way. I mean, this was a place different from Richmond, lots of mosquitoes, lots of wild animals, at least initially, it actually made it pretty tough going. Page was born in 1808. Unlike a lot of other slaveholders, Page's master taught him to read and write. He taught Page to read and write so that Page could work in his general store. His mother and brother were sold on the auction block to raise the money that the master needed to make the trip from Richmond to Tallahassee. I hated watching my mother and brother sold off from me. They stood on a big platform and was sold as one. I will never forget the street they were sold on. It was called Wall Street. I cried when I had to leave my mother and brother in Virginia. Here we have the voice of one enslaved person talking about his experience moving from the Upper South, particularly Richmond, Virginia, to the Lower South, Tallahassee, Florida. Whites rode in wagons and the slaves walked. It took about seven to eight weeks. They would stop after 20, 25 miles each day, after which the slaves would pitch the tents and, and put things ready for the evening. They would cook. And then sometimes they said, although they were tired, their owners made them entertain them by dancing and singing. And if someone could play the banjo or, or some other instrument, and he talked about his experience going through North Carolina and South Carolina, getting to Georgia, the shortage of food sometimes, some of the nights where he heard the howling of wild animals and thought that they were going to be attacked by wild animals. Bahamia was a free Negro in 1850. My great great granddaddy bought Bahamia. State of Florida, Leon County, July 20th, AD 1860. Know all men by these presents that I, Robert C. Williams, for and in consideration of the sum of $1,050 to me paid in hand by John Finlayson, one certain Negro slave named Bahamia, aged about 15 years, and do warrant him sound in mind and body and a slave for life. He was different from any other slave that my granddaddy had bought. He had been free and he had learned to read and write and was educated. And the other slaves, it was against the law to teach him to read and write. The settlement of my great granddaddy's estate, I've got a list of them by name and age. So I know exactly and value. It was the most distressing thing to look at that settlement of his state. The names of the slaves came down and then the names of the mules started and they had to make a mark to show the difference where it was people and mules. 
This house was built in the 1830s by enslaved craftsmen who were the property of Richard Keith Cole. Very likely the people who built this house would have learned those trades while enslaved in another place and performed similar tasks prior to bringing those to the area. So they were typically in all the building construction in Tallahassee at this time. They were the property of individual people who in the census would be listed as the copper workers or the blacksmiths or the carpenters. And the individuals who were listed in the census as the carpenters are profiting from the skills of these enslaved people. I, uh, I'll stop here, I guess, um, just to make sure that there's time um if anybody has any questions or anything but what what i what you just saw just now was as again was like excerpts of other of longer sections so that's why it fades to black and then sort of comes up so those are excerpts of longer sections as opposed to like it's not cohesive in that sense like a preview um and when we did that that was and before we finished the final edit so when you see the documentary there'll be some things that are different we actually commissioned a a jazz um, musician who was in um, the Gregory Porter band, in case any of you guys like the Gregory Porter. Um, so it's a Grammy award winning jazz um, group and he and he did original soundtrack for us. So we're excited about that. So that's the difference there as well. Um, but another thing that you can probably recognize, you know, some of the speakers who are in that. So we, you know, we, we definitely were, um, had a lot of support from the community. So you saw Dr. Rivers from FAMU and um, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Mason um, and Dr. Jones, you, Maxine Jones is also in it from FSU, as well as um, the support from the Grove and the Goodwood and the um, Tallahassee Museum. So, yeah. Well, I would suggest, um, why don't we use the chat to um, ask questions or to make comments for Valerie. That might be the easiest way since we can't see everybody on one screen. So please enter into the chat um, anything that you wanted to um, ask or comment on. I would just like to comment that I can't wait till this comes out. May 20th, you said on WFSU? Yeah, it's on, it's on May 20th on WFSU. It's not on Passport. I mean, the other documentary, Daring Women Doctors, that's on Passport. But this new one will just be on TV. You can just access it you know, on your television. And then it usually lives on their website to just stream for a few weeks after the broadcast. OK, now here's a, here's a uh, question from Peggy Ramsey. Do you think Tyler Perry could follow in the Harpo path? Also, do you feel like film filmmakers should make a choice stance in filming in Georgia in response to the voting suppression there? I guess that's not related to your documentary. What do you have any thoughts about that? Like, how, um, how can well, film? I, I think that, I, I think Tyler Perry's already you know sort of blazing his own trail. I'm not sure if I understand if you say follow in the Harpo path unless you mean like novels, you know. Um, I think Oprah Winfrey's obviously has, has always been a big reader, you know, with her book club. And then she also likes sort of, um, she's also attracted to stories that are about, you know, ch challenging childhoods, you know, which a lot of literature does handle that. So, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, obviously they're good friends and he's blazed his own trail. So I'm not sure he would be interested in what she particularly is interested in. Here's a question. Uh, where did you get the photos of the enslaved persons? Uh, through a lot of archival research, um, which basically means, um, well, we use a Florida memory for some um, uh, with the state archives. And then going up to the Library of Congress, you actually sort of have to go to the Library of Congress in order to really access the images that you would need, because not all of them have been digitized. And a lot of them you can only see if you're there, or you can only download them if you're there, put it that way. And then also, um, the way they the way they label things is difficult because it's been years and years. Whatever they however they label things in the fifties, we actually need somebody to explain, you know, like where they put it in the fifties. So um, so archival research there, and then um, New York Public Library also has, and Smithsonian also has um, public domain images is basically. But most things are in the public domain from that that century, so that's helpful. Okay. 
Uh, Barbara says the film looks fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing. Kathy asks, did you include information about the cemetery that is on the Miccosukee Greenway? No, I'm, I didn't. I mean, why, I, I think I spoke about the cemeteries in a sort of general way, not a specific way. Um, so. Felicia asked, is there a resource that provides the number of enslaved people in Tallahassee and their family names? There a resource for that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if there's a centralized resource. I, what I might, my understanding is that each, each um, plantation may have, the former plantation, so like the Goodwood or the Grove, obviously the Grove has done a better, you know, because there are sort of a part of the state, um, I think they, you know, have some records of um, who were enslaved there, but I think, I don't know if they even have complete, I think the person would have to sort of do enslaved record there, back to the archives here, you know, and, and tax records um, can often, tax records and court records um, because of how people were sold uh, to pay bills and, you know, um, and you had to pay taxes, you know, all of that, you could put it together, but I don't think there's a centralized, like, thing. Betty, Betty has a comment. This looks well worth waiting for. I'm so enjoying your presentation. We're lucky to have you in town. Amen. Katie asks, thank you so much, Valerie, for agreeing to speak. I will definitely be watching. And she says, I'm curious with your impressive background with multiple platforms in media, what are your thoughts on streaming and its effects on the industry? Streaming, you mean as opposed to like going to the movie theater? Or yeah. just, oh, I guess, I mean, I think, I guess whatever, I think I've adjusted. I, I suppose I've adjusted to the to it, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, I remember the days when we would all wait for the thing to come on, the show to come on, and that had its own excitement. You know, I remember um, when Cecile and I were growing up, when Roots came on the on TV, you know, and how all the family would gather and we'd all be centrally located for that hour or two. And now it doesn't, you just stream it whenever you want to, you know what I mean? So I think the downside of that is a little bit less gathering together, you know, with the two to watch things. and. And even as a community, but but people still form communities though. I mean, in terms of like watching whatever um, uh, Games of Thrones, even though they watched it at different times, they still have communities. So I think I'm okay with the streaming. You know, I, I'm I'm amazed with the, uh, I'm a sort of, I'm a little bit intimidated with the number of shows that there are to choose from. You know, you feel a bit overwhelmed and I kind of wait maybe like the rest of the world for the Golden Globe and Oscar nominations to know what I should focus on, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there's so many things. Um, here's one from Mary Kay. There was some archeology span work done at the cemetery in Benton Hills. Just wondering if you had access to that. Um, no, um, I mean, I did, I, mean, I, was, I was aware of it, but we're not, we're not, this documentary doesn't actually go very like specifically in terms of like, this was located on this corner and that was located on that corner. It's a more sort of big picture view. Okay. Um, Felicia says, do you use any material from the Black Archives located at FAMU in your film? Well, we do, we did film there. We, that's where we filmed Dr. Rivers <laughs> in, their, in their space at there. So I guess you, whatever you see in there. We did actually um, film other archival things at the archives um, and, and different images. I'm not sure if we ended up using them in the film, but we did film there. Um, have you done, done anything at Riley House? Yes, yes. Riley House might have information. We did, um, we did film also at the Riley House and Altamese Barnes is also in this documentary. So um, you'd be able to, to, hear her, to hear her speak. And she speaks a lot about Mr. Riley. So we end up hearing about his, his life. You know, I have to make a comment and observation. I think one of the most powerful scenes that you showed is the one with the uh, relative of the slave owner reading the, you know, the price of the, the 15 year old and that it was listed with the mules. I mean, that really is very telling and powerful. I remember taking kids to field trips at the, um, I guess it's now the Riley House, it was downtown and they had, you know, these uh, manifests with the slaves and how much they cost and it was it really is eye-opening so that I think that scene really is powerful um, that was my observation thanks uh, um, Donna says thank you Valerie Wendy says do you have another project in the planning stages I do I I, I am I have another project that's going to be a movie this time hopefully um, 
uh, and this movie is kind of related to this topic. I mean, not kind of, it's actually related to the topic. It's, it's basically, I mean, a fictionalized version of, a, of um, a friend of mine who wrote a book, who's a, she's a psychologist and she, and she wrote a book about, um, uh, about how, about, about a group of African-American women who are in group therapy and how some of their interpersonal struggles I mean, relationships were coming from the legacy of slavery. So some of the beliefs that come from, from that period of time and then sort of continue on. She um, wrote a book about that. So we fictionalized it where um, it's about a woman lawyer and, um, and she um, you know, encounters these different challenges as she adopts a child and that, 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 that's the story of it. So, and when we first wrote it, it wasn't really centered in Tallahassee, but now I'd like to make it, uh, we, I would like to make it in Tallahassee and and hopefully um, that would be one of my next local projects. Okay. All right, well, it, comments are coming through. It's excellent and everybody's certainly looking forward to the, to the uh, screening on May 20th. So we really appreciate your um, sharing with us, Valerie, and we're so glad you're a member of our local league, yay. Yeah. And, um, I, wanted, uh, I wanted also to uh, ask Cecile Schoon, who I, mentioned is going soon to be our state next state president. And we're really happy to have her on this uh, meeting tonight. And Cecile, I wonder if you wanted to just share anything as far as what you see the year ahead for the state league and what are some of the things that are gonna be happening that we can get excited about and how can we help? Well, I really appreciate that opportunity and I don't wanna to be too presumptuous cause you know, you gotta vote. Well. But <laughs> Being even, um, I do. I have been talking with some of our board members, and I, I have some ideas. Um, I really want to uh, work on strengthening every individual league member and every individual league, and the state. I think there. I've heard so many wonderful things that go on in local leagues that oftentimes the rest of the league doesn't know about. You know, and so we can share best practices and inspiration. So I'd like to help uh, share that kind of information. Um, we are talking about um, another concept is basically sort of changing our perspective of the, of the towards people that we are trying to assist. And I myself get in that mode sometimes with, you know, this poor person and you're trying to help them. And that's very off-putting and that's um, impersonal and creates space between ourselves and the communities we would like to work with. And I'd like to, for us to work on peer-to-peer -peer because many of the communities that we're trying to get them to vote more or know about a topic, they have a lot of survivor skills and they have a lot of wisdom and they're doing a lot of things in their own community to survive, but we kind of, it's easy to overlook it because we're so focused on civic engagement in the sense that we're accustomed to. So just kind of like, you know, creating a, a common language where we can elevate each other. It's been my experience in Bay County primarily that when those kinds of opportunities are, you take those kind of opportunities to elevate what the community is doing itself, they tend to engage more with us as league members and they tend to buy into, hey, this is working. I, I'm going to vote. You listen to me. We're, we're kind of validating each other. So just those kinds of ideas. Basically, we all do so much incredible work. And I know I've heard people say, you know, they get a little frustrated because they feel like they're knocking on the door and they want to help, but they're not being listened to. And I think sometimes that's that sense of you don't live here. You're just visiting when it's time to vote. And then you go back to your community. And I never see you. And I think it, as we start to kind of like go peer to peer and learn from the people and kind of share that, you know, common experiences, I think we can break down that sense of that we're helicoptering in and going to fix everything and kind of get some organic solutions and work with them in that manner. So, you know, continuing to do many of the things that we do so well, but maybe tweaking our approach a little bit. So those are my two ideas at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, well, Cecile, we're excited that we know you are a neighbor in Panama City, so we know you're close by. You can 
you're welcome over here every anytime. So um, with that, um, I just want to thank again, uh, Valerie, for this wonderful program. And so nice to have such talent right in the neighborhood and one of our members. And thank you all for being here tonight. Um, appreciate your uh, attendance, your um, contributions to our league. Next month, be sure we have our last hot topics coming up May 20th, I believe it is, which is a Thursday, which is going to be a legislative wrap up. So um, we will um, kind of all bring your hankies and shed some tears when we hear the legislative wrap up, which is probably going to be pretty depressing, but it is what it is, and that's why we're here to fight the good fight, educate voters. You know, we are defending democracy, and you all play an important part of that. So, with that, I say good night and thank you all for being here. And uh, tune in to Hot Topics next month. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Leave me.